James, that was great. Good evening, everyone. It's a great honor for, for me to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Cornelia, for inviting me. My name is Magnus Sjön. I'm a practicing landscape architect and architect based in Stockholm, Sweden. And my contribution to the discussion here tonight will be on urban nature and how landscapes and natural processes can be incorporated into the design of our open spaces in the city. This will be exemplified through a couple of recently built projects from Sweden and a larger urban planning project called the Stockholm Royal Seaport, which I toured with Cornelia when she was in Stockholm this fall. And just to make sure that everyone knows where Stockholm, Sweden is, I'd like to show you this map of Europe. Uh, Stockholm is the capital of Sweden, it's right where the uh, pink dot is. Right, so a couple of years ago, I was asked to illustrate and co-write a new chapter on landscape architecture in a book called The Architect's Handbook. And since it was the first edition with a landscape chapter, we figured we needed a really bold statement in the introduction to this new section in the book. So we said, everything is a landscape, and this is really the core of everything to me. And here is a quote that I translated. A landscape occurs when natural processes intersect with human ideas and actions. And if you look around, this is really happening everywhere. Most of our clothes can be traced back to a cotton field somewhere in the world, and even the tiniest bits in our mobile phones can be traced back to a mine somewhere in the world. Our food comes from farmlands, uh, cities and buildings out of concrete or wood. Everything is a landscape. And then there's also the invisible, basic ecosystem services, like the air that we breathe and the stress-reducing qualities that nature provides, which are essential for our well-being. And nature provides this for free. And the landscape is also where our culture is expressed and the ground for human-to-human -human interaction. And I believe that this kind of thinking can help us re-establish our vital connection to nature and help us make better and more sustainable choices in the future. And we need to understand our role in the biosphere, that we're not separated from nature, and again, start to include humans in the ecosystem's thinking. Over 50% of the world's population live in cities, and it increases every day. And this is the situation landscape architects are often faced with. Urbanity is attributed with words like development, active and innovative, while nature is given the passive role as conservative and preserver of the status quo. And this often leads to locked positions where only one can win and one has to lose. But the great thing about being a landscape architect, but also the biggest challenge, is essentially to design smart interfaces between the urban and nature, to build a strong symbiosis where both man and nature are winners. And I've had the opportunity as a part of a creative team to design this urban infield park under a motorway in central Stockholm. A movement and passing through was the only program requested by the municipality. We were not allowed to encourage longer stays in the park since there was dangerous goods being transported on the flyover above. And how can you make that interesting and safe? So based on a reading of the site where three types of landscapes met, the ambition was to integrate these landscapes into an interesting whole. The urban landscape of the city, the green lush landscape by the canal, and the infrastructural landscape were combined and reflected in the park's design. And the topography of the park was giving a triangular design that allowed us for folding of the surfaces and the idea was to emphasize two viewpoints in the park, one from below, a green character, which faces the natural landscape, and one from above, where we proposed a more paved and graveled character towards the city landscape. And while walking through the park, the three characters mixes in various kaleidoscopic combination. And good accessibility was met with a required maximum slope of one to 20, and these requirements were developed into a serpentine-like pathway. And finally, the walkway was further developed to enable an additional kind of smuggled-in program, which was uh, skateboarding. <laughs> but the funny thing is that even though you design for movement, some people started using this park in various other ways. This is an image from a temporary film festival event, and it shows 
the need for good public open spaces in the city. This is goal number 11 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. And to exemplify this, I want to credit Umeå, a northern Swedish town famous for their abundance of birch trees, for their work on the riverbank. And numerous proposals for developing the riverfront were presented and refused. But a few years ago, it was finally decided that the whole riverbank should become a public space with a mix of cultural and recreational activities for the citizens of Umeå. The town would once again face the river and it would be accessible for all. And again, I've had the opportunity to design a small part of the riverbank where we co-created parts of the program with the citizens and also left undesigned spaces for temporary use and later development. And we could also recycle the old keystone that had been kept in a forest nearby for more than 50 years. And we used it as a new retention wall to improve climate locally and make more parkland accessible. So let's zoom out for a while and look at some of the big challenges we have ahead. This diagram shows the concept of planetary boundaries, a safe operating space for humanity made by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And I'm not going to go through this diagram in detail, but as you can see, we have exceeded the safe operating space in a few areas already. So what can we do about this as professionals dealing with human settlements? Well, there are many fields in this diagram that are directly connected to the work that we do. For example, land system change, climate change, and biodiversity. So there is this kind of emergency for us to be smart in how we plan our cities for the future. Now, let's have a look on how the Stockholm Royal Seaport tries to stay within the planetary boundaries. So Stockholm is a city on water. And the Royal Seaport project, just east of the city centre, is a long-term planning project led by the city of Stockholm, who's also the main land owner. And planning has to consider and integrate the neighbouring urban national park, which in many ways has similarities with uh, Stanley Park here in Vancouver. It has a very high an ecological and cultural value. And the project will be a transformation from an old harbour area where an oil depot, a container terminal, ports and a gas plant used to be, into a thriving new part of town, um, consisting of 12,000 new apartments, 35,000 workplaces. And the overall goal of this area is to be fossil fuel free by 2030, to reduce carbon emissions to 1.5 tons per person a year, and to be adapted to climate change. And planning commenced already in 2003, but in 2010, local politicians agreed on a very progressive environmental program for the area. And this program has five uh, main focus areas. Energy efficiency, to reduce the kilowatt hours per year for heating and electricity, and preferably construct plus energy buildings. And transportation, that means to turn the usual priorities upside down. Pedestrians and cyclists first, public transportation second, carpools third, and last, private cars, cars. And all vehicles should be electrical or run on biogas. And recycling, a smart waste management, where waste is seen as a resource. And regarding lifestyle, the slogan for that is the right choice should be easy to make. And each new resident um, are offered a crash course in sustainable lifestyle. And urban gardening spots are offered and climate change adaptation. The Swedish future climate will be warmer in general, have more heat waves, more rain, more heavy rain, and rising sea levels. So to meet the overall goals of climate change adaptation, the city needed more knowledge on the subject. So they initiated a research project where Stockholm Resilience Center and 10 more participants were involved. And they focused on ecosystem services and their work led to this report, Let Nature Do the Work. It was a thorough research leading to a selection of urban ecosystem services that could perform well in the new development. For example, greenery reduces flooding, water and plants reduces and regulates the temperature in the city, and urban nature strengthens the surrounding ecosystem. 
And the adjacent ecosystem in the national park was also studied through the powerful tools the city already had developed, like the Biotope Map, which is a geographic information system database covering the land use and habitat networks all over Stockholm. And these studies showed the importance of the oak landscape and how oaks were supporting high biodiversity and how these habitat networks had to be strengthened. And so how could all this information be implemented in the plan for the Stockholm Royal Seaport? The municipality doesn't have the resources or skills for design, so they developed a tool called the Green Space Factor. And the Green Space Factor should be more or equal to 0 0.6 when dividing the eco-efficient surfaces by the total site area. And an eco-efficient surface is basically surfaces that perform ecosystem services. And um, this is what's being handed out when you start a project within the project, so to speak. It's basically a list of requirements that you have to meet in your project. And you have to score on biodiversity, climate adaptation, and social values, and mul multifunctional surfaces, as well as planting oaks, are premiered among the requirements. And all the developers working with the city on this project has to sign a contract to state that all the criteria on sustainability are met. And this will also be monitored during the course of five to 10 years after the project is built. And the green space factor also applies on public spaces, streetscapes, and all other areas. And let's have a look at an example that I work with in collaboration with GA Architects in Stockholm. The site is adjacent to the old gas works buildings that were listed as cultural heritage and all the new designs should conform to this character. And the site boundary is right at the perimeter of the buildings and there's parking underground and you see almost no visible green but it contains a hidden landscape. Almost like a landscape apartment we proposed a walled garden on the top floor and by designing this like a natural landscape taken in from the urban national park nearby with local flora combined with urban gardens for the residents and very deep but light rooftop soil to keep rainwater runoff low and good living conditions for the plants, we could meet the criteria of the green space factor. And regarding stormwater management, again under the theme of let nature do the work, keep stormwater drainage to a minimum so there will be plant bed, and they will have a mixture of soil and volcanic rock, which has great water preserving capacity and will partly clean the stormwater. It is also a great growing medium for urban trees, and any excess water will be transported through to the nearby sea. And the grading of the whole area is also made according to rising sea levels. The Stockholm Royal Seaport is still under construction, and it's mainly just a building site right now. Um, only a few blocks are built and they're not planned in accordance with a new environmental program. But here's a streetscape rendering showing the future of the project where we see the proposed plant beds to let nature do the work and perform ecosystem services. And so to conclude the Stockholm Royal Seaport, I believe the project has great potential in many ways and really points towards the future of our built environment. And I admire the attempts on letting nature do the work for us and the integration of green spaces everywhere in the project. And I'm really looking forward to see it come to life and see what works and what doesn't. It's not going to be the grand solution and it's not going to save our planet, but it's probably one of the most ambitious attempts we have at the moment. And it's certainly something to be inspired from. And just a few last words. <clears throat> We're slowly learning how to make sustainable cities in practice when starting from scratch. But a big challenge that we're still facing is how to adapt our existing cities to climate change and simultaneously meet the demand for more housing and workplaces coming with increased urbanization. Stockholm is facing a huge housing shortage at the moment. So core, core architects where I work are currently doing state-funded research on how the single family homes in our suburbs could contribute to solving these issues. According to a recent st study, uh, survey made in Sweden, 30% of all the single family homeowners state that they have more space than they need. 
and there are two million single-family houses in Sweden. So what if 1% of all the single-family homes could be transformed into two homes instead of one? In 25 years, we would have 500,000 new homes. And that would save a lot of space in our cities for nature. Thank you.